Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We're glad you could join us for another hour of answering those gardening questions. If you'd like to get in touch with us, dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. Emailed questions go to byf at unl.edu for a future show. Please attach those pictures as JPEGs. Do not forget to tell us where you live. We love hearing from you on Thursday nights, but also don't forget to follow us during the week on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So with that out of the way, Jody, you have a weapon and bagworms. Yes, so Jonathan and I have both been getting a lot of calls at the county offices, and the question is, time to spray now, right? And it's not time to spray now. So <laughs> what you may be seeing are these bags in the tree. And so right now, uh, they're not doing anything but hanging around. You may see bags that look like this that are actually empty because they are male bags. It's on this side. So if you open them up, there's nothing in there because the moth emerged last fall. And in the other bag though, and this is the ones that we want to pick off, are the ones that are the female bag. But if you see them, I would say right now it's a time to pick them off, the ones you can reach. And I have this trusty <laughs> picker. So you can extend your reach. So picking them off will help you. You want to destroy them. You don't want to put them in any compost or anywhere close to other trees. They are going to damage the evergreen trees, but the time to treat is going to be mid-June. So the little caterpillars will emerge from these female bags, hundreds, probably like 200 eggs, little tiny caterpillars. And that's the end of May, beginning of June. What you want to use is a BT spray that is meant for the caterpillars. And it's going to be most effective when they are young because they've got to consume that. So wait, watch the show. We will let <laughs> you know when they emerge. Perfect. And I like the picker thing because you could do all sorts of other things. Yeah, with do you it. want that? Yeah, no. <laughs> well, maybe just in case one of you goes over long. <laughs> all right, what do we have, Matt? Besides, it looks like tiramisu. Yeah, I got actually some samples, pro, uh, soil profiles, and they're actually from a putting green. And the reason I brought them is just to show the root structure of grass. And as you well know, it's pretty hot outside. Everybody's probably thinking about watering their lawn. Uh, but that's not always necessary just because we have hot weather briefly. Uh, the rains will return. And the best way to determine whether or not you need water is to basically, you know, dig into your profile and check and see if there's moisture down there. Uh, tall fescue lawns can have roots down to four feet, so they can tolerate a lot, uh, a lot of stress. They might look stressed, but overnight they'll probably recoup that water and they'll look fine by morning. Uh, but looking at this one, this is actually off of a putting green. So we have grass that is grown through sand. So we, uh, we use a little bit more water just because we don't have uh, the reserve capacity like soil does. But you can see that those roots down here are about you know six, six to seven inches. And actually last year when we were doing a drought trial, we had them down past 12 inches and we had no water irrigation for over a month and the plants just wouldn't die. Uh, so pretty tough for drought research, but uh, plants are pretty capable of growing deep into the soil profile. Uh, so we don't want to overwater, and that's the key. Uh, deep and infrequent is going to allow you to get deeper roots. Uh, so if you're thinking about watering just because it's hot and windy, uh, it's probably not the best choice. Uh, you want to do it deep and infrequent and allow those roots to actually stress a little bit or grow deeper into the soil profile. Because if we overwater, those roots are going to be shallow, and then come summertime, we're going to have to water all the time, otherwise they're going to die because they have no roots down below that level. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. All right, Kyle, we have something on roses. Yeah, so we have some kind of purple purple spots on roses. And this is a little bit earlier than we tend to see this, but this is downy mildew of roses um, caused by, a, uh, by an oomycete. So it's a, kind of one, of one of our water molds. Um, so it, yeah, it, it really, the symptomology really varies depending on the type of rose that you have. And so, one of the more common things that you'll see are just kind of these not indeterminate purple to brown reddish splotches um, kind of on the leaves. You might also get some, some reddish uh, discoloration along the stem as well. And that's another, another one of our symptoms for downy mildew. And this, this fungus, or this oomycete, apologies, 
This one it kind of likes our moderate temperatures, so 60, 70 degrees, and a lot of humidity. So um, it infects when it's when um, humidity is above 85 percent. So weather that we've recently had, kind of moderate temperatures, it's been fairly humid, this, this guy can take off. One of the issues with controlling this though is this disease does go systemic in the roses. And so it, it, will, it will survive over, over winter in the infected stems, leaves, and crowns. So when we always talk about sanitation here in a couple of months, really important to do some sanitation if you do have, see any downy mildew on your roses. All right, thank you, Kyle. And I don't know that we've actually ever had a sample of downy mildew on roses. Ooh, so it's awesome. a first. <laughs> okay, Sarah, it's kind of pretty, but not really, right? Well, no, not really, especially not when you see a whole tree that's affected like this. And so um, this is these leaves are off of a hawthorn tree. This is ha happens to be a, a cockspur thornless hawthorn. And um, what we're looking at here is all these little brown blotches on, on the, the leaves. So these are caused by a sawfly larva. And a sawfly is like a, a, a really, really small little wasp-like creature. They lay their eggs on the leaves and then the caterpillar-like uh, immatures tunnel into the leaves. They tunnel between the layers of the leaf. So I, I'm not sure if you can all see this or not, but the layers of the leaf are separated, the top and the bottom layers, so they have become almost like puffy. There's an empty space in there. So what you're looking at is sections of the leaf where the larvae have eaten away the tissue between the upper and the lower surfaces of the leaves, okay? So you might look at this in the spring and say, oh, I've got some leaf spot diseases, I've got a fungal issue, or I've got some um, uh, uh, frost damage or something along that line. This is actually an insect issue. And you know, the thing about it is even though when this is um, affecting a large area on the tree, it can look bad, but it really doesn't affect the overall health of the tree very much. So you can just ignore it and just let it go. Um, there are species of hawthorn which are more susceptible to these leaf miners than others. Uh, a cockspur happens to be one that is very susceptible. You could go with a different species and hopefully eliminate this issue um, uh, permanently, on a permanent basis. Um, but otherwise, insecticidal control of these guys really isn't very effective and usually isn't warranted based on the, the low severity of this problem. All right, thanks, Sarah. And it's a good thing that's a thornless one. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Jody, you get the first round of picture questions, and this is asparagus from two different parts of the state. Uh, curving and curling, one is at Giltner, and the other is actually out in Kearney. So we're seeing sort of this weirdness and then some channels and all sorts of things. They wanna know what is causing it and then what can they do about it, of course. Okay, so that looks like asparagus beetle. So these beetles, you may not see them feeding, but they're about a quarter of an inch long. There are two different types. One looks kind of like a ladybug, so red with black spots, and the other one is red and black with, I think, six white spots. But they do feed on there and make it look curled and deformed. So pruning those out is probably the best thing. If you do see the beetles, I would pick those off. Um, also check for eggs that may be laid um, on the spears. Okay. Um, if, you know, if there's a lot of damage, then you may want to use, I don't know, spinosad or horticulture oil on there. But picking off should be the best if you do see the adult, adults there. All right, thanks, Jody. Okay, so Matt, we have, uh, this is a viewer who is about 30 miles west of Niobrara, but not in an area that's been flooded. Mm -hmm. And he has uh, sort of some interesting issues associated with his turf. So it's looking like just some of it might have died out. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like there was either some undesirable species, maybe some rough bluegrass or even some ryegrass that just died out over the winter. And I don't know, by the looks of that, that's it's just still coming out and greening up. Uh, so you're probably gonna have to reseed if you did have some winter kill. Um, and a lot of times that's just from a snow load sitting on the grass and it basically suffocates it. And then coming out, those low spots are gonna be the ones that are hit the worst. Uh, so you're probably gonna have to add some seed. If you have bluegrass and there's smaller areas, it'll probably fill in. Um, just a little bit of extra fertilizer and your lawn should be looking a little better. All right, he did say he did do some hydro seeding, so yeah, hopefully that'll, that'll help. Okay, all right, thank you so much. 
All right, we're in Ogallala for this one, Kyle. Oh, out west. Out west. And this is a uh, blue rug junipers that are maybe eight to 10 years old, have always been looking pretty good. And this year, of course, we had an interesting winter. So he's, he's really wondering, is this winter injury, are, are we seeing one of those interesting juniper diseases? Um, unfortunately, from the, from the pictures, it's really difficult to tell. Um, there are quite a few diseases that can hit the junipers, um, especially some of the older junipers. Phomopsis is one that we typically tend to, um, tend to see. But that will really affects the um, just the ends of the branches, and so I would I'd recommend following those those dead or those brown branches all the way as far down as you can, and if they do start to green up a little bit further in, maybe we are dealing with a fungus. Um, could also just be winter injury. We did have quite the severe winter this year, a lot of de uh, winter desiccation as things dried out. So unfortunately, without really without some more information. Hard to say anything, so I wouldn't recommend doing a whole lot right now. Kind of just take a wait and see approach. All right, thanks, Kyle. I do know that in our backyard farmer garden, we had vole damage underneath. That's so who knows? That's an, yeah, could yeah. easily be another thing. All right, thank you so much. All right, so Sarah, it's lilac question mm -hmm. time. Okay. <laughs> we have three different pictures from three different viewers. The first one is. 10 foot tall dwarf Korean lilacs. The rabbits stood on the snow and devoured. <laughs> this is Underwood, Iowa, and he wonders if the pruning method is about the same. The second is a Mineola, Iowa viewer. So the second picture is um, how should these lilacs be pruned? They're really kind of blooming sort of strangely and, and maybe some damage as well. And then the third picture is, these were bare roots. They're now seven feet tall. They're only flowering and leafing out on the top, couple of feet of branches. So picture number one, what do you think? Well, so with the, the wildlife injury, the rabbits stripping the bark off of these stems, I guess what I would go in and, and, and prune out the stems that have been stripped, you know, because those probably will die, especially if, I mean, if they've taken off one little piece on one side, but the rest of the bark is intact, then the branch has a chance to still live. But if the, if the bark is stripped off all the way around, which is typically what rabbits will do, then go ahead and cut it down and um, the, the plant will send up some new shoots from the crown. So um, Usually with lilacs, what we want to do is we want to get on an every year pruning cycle where you're taking out some of the heaviest stems every year. We usually say about a third of the thickest stems every year. Mm -hmm. And that helps to maintain the height of the plant. It helps to open up the canopy a little bit so that you get sun all the way through. Uh, and then you'll get new shoots coming up from the crown. You know, the other thing I was thinking about looking at this picture too is that you might have some oyster shell scale issues or some other scales on this. Oyster shell scale is really hard to pick out because it's very close. It's right on the bark surface and it looks like bark if, if you're unsure of what the bark looks like. So if you have a really heavy oyster shell infestation on those stems, you're gonna need to cut them out because most likely those stems are gonna be dead and then you're gonna need to do some control of the insect itself. Sometimes when plants grow like this the, in the picture, they're, getting, they're not getting enough sun to the base of the plant and so that's why you have foliage just at the top and not at the base. So you might want to, to do some opening up of that canopy so that you can get better sun penetration to the base. Um, but then again, some lilacs tend to grow that way too. Um, and there's not gonna be a whole lot you're gonna be able to do about it. Some varieties or cultivars, I should say, just tend to be kind of tall and lanky and not well leafed all the way to the base. And um, you're either gonna have to live with that or take that cultivar out and plant something else. All right, thanks, Sarah. Well, you know, gardening can provide beauty around your home as well as something to eat. It also does involve quite a bit of work from time to time. Knowing how to avoid some of the aches and pains that can come from digging, raking, pulling weeds can ensure a lifetime of enjoyment. So for our first feature, we're going to show you a few tips on relieving the stress and strain on your body when you're out in the garden. This time of the year, we're anxious to get out in our gardens and do some yard work. And uh, one of the major problems with that are what we call musculoskeletal injuries or ergonomic related injuries, where we strain and stress our muscles in joints uh, from doing tasks that might be a little too hard or doing them in the wrong way. Um, so the problem that we're really trying to, to target is that. So our aches and pains that we may have um, from working out in our garden and using different types of hand tools. Um, so I have a background in ergonomics where we talk about 
how to make those jobs a little bit easier, how we can pick better tools, and how we can uh, get it to fit our bodies a little bit better. So there's lots of tools we use out there from shovels to rakes and hoes, um, starting moving materials around, whether it's we're starting our planting beds or pl transplanting, um, thinking about our body positioning and the tools that we're using for the tasks. The jobs are always easier if we use the right tools, um, if we select the tools, and we'll be showing some different tools for that. Um, so making sure we get ones that fit our body well. Um, if it works for your husband or your friend, it may not work well for you. So picking the tools that are the most comfortable for us help. Um, not doing a task for too long. We call that repetitive use. So not doing the same task for hours on end. Taking lots of breaks um, so we give our body a chance to recuperate. Drinking water is always a good thing to keep ourselves hydrated and keep our muscles and joints working the way that they should be um, and reducing those strains to our musculoskeletal system. So we want to do that. Um, oftentimes when we pick tools, we want to use neutral hand positions. So hand positions that we're not bending our joints too much, that we're not stooping over or bending over at the waist, that we're squatting our knees as we pick up tools. So we, we bend our knees, get a good grip on it. Um, I have several tools here that have extra handles on them. Uh, when we talk about hose and tillage tools or weeding tools, having longer handles oftentimes helps. And then as well as when we have shovels, adding extra handles to them, uh, like a D-handle halfway down the, the barrel of the, of the shovel, that can help us with the grip and positioning to prevent our hands from bending in ways that may be hurtful if we do it in a, for a long period of time. So the combination of buying the correct tools and using the tools properly can help us uh, prevent future injuries. Um, and a lot, some of these injuries don't happen right away. A lot of them are cumulative, so it's after many uses that we get that, and it's an ache and pain that continues to show up every time we do the task. Those are all signs of things that we can use to, to prevent future injuries. So taking lots of breaks, making sure that we use the tools correctly, um, using the correct tools as we go through that, and uh, it always helps to have others helping us. So doing everything by ourselves can sometimes wear us out a little bit more as well. Um, so those are some of the main points to remember as we go through this and uh, have fun out there gardening. When you go out in the yard to have fun, you don't want to suffer that pain from doing it. So just a few simple additions to those ordinary tools can help keep that back straight or lessen the stress on your wrists. And you know, it's, you really shouldn't have to make a noise when you stand back up again. That sounds <laughs> like you shouldn't have done that, right? <laughs> All right, so Jody, you have um, Knockout roses, this is in Columbus, and they're in close proximity to one another. They all seem fine last fall. Two have leafed out well. The third has minimal growth at the base, and the canes are covered with brown, scaly-looking bumps. She's saying she's seeing small white insects appearing from the bumps. She's using insecticidal soap. She wonders what this is. Is there hope, or should she start over? Okay, well, Sarah just talked about scale, and I think Jonathan <laughs> talked about scale, and I think Wayne talked about scale. There's a lot of scale insects around. So a lot of people don't know that they are an insect because they are very immobile at, at these stages. They're pretty lazy. But if she's seeing uh, little white things crawling out, then they may be in the crawler stage, and that's the stage you do want to treat. If you can't scrub them off with a scrubby sponge or brush, or um, prune them out, then you could treat with, I think you said you have soap. For these, are, these are armored scales, so the, it's better to use horticultural oil to, to get them, but at the crawler stage. So that's the only time they move, and it's a really short window, and then they lock down and start sucking on the, or, or feeding on the cambium, so. Okay, so. And straight. Kyle just said that he has seen some crawlers. So yep, yeah. Here, yeah, so the time is going to be soon, and you want to treat. Like, you know, yeah. any day now. Get out there and <laughs> do everything all at once. Yep. <laughs> all right, Matt, you have a couple of different is this a flower or weed question. All right. uh, the first one is <clears throat> Omaha, excuse me. 
and has this star-like flower with shoots that look like chives. Try digging, they have little bulbs. Awesome. <laughs> Invading perennials, wants to know what are they and are they harmful, so this is number uh, one. Yeah, they're, they're not really harmful. They're, uh, it's a star of Bethlehem and it actually has, yes, a bulb at the bottom. Uh, you can see the flowers are pretty, so if you don't want to get rid of them, you can keep them and enjoy the flowers, but they will spread, so mm -hmm. uh, you probably want to take care of them while you can. Uh, so here's one here that, uh, I don't know. Backyard farmer Backyard garden. Backyard farmer garden. Yeah. Okay, so they're in there too. Uh, and you can see that they do have a bulb. Uh, and the main thing is uh, trying to get this bulb out because if we take the tops off by mowing or whatever, they are going to reemerge and they're not going to die. So if we only have a few in the lawn, the easiest way to do it would be to basically just remove these and they're not going to come back and get them before they seed out because they are pretty prolific uh, seed producers and then you'll have too many to pull out. Um, the other thing, if you do have a lot of them, uh, this next picture is another one that's seen in a lot of lawns. Uh, early in the spring, it's grown a lot faster than the turf. Uh, this would be wild garlic. Mm -hmm. And same thing, you, if you can, remove them because they're just going to spread. Uh, if you have too many to remove by hand, uh, there's only a couple options that work. Um, 2,4-D has been shown to do some damage to it, but it does take multiple applications. Uh, you want to make sure that you add uh, some sort of surfactant with that because they do have a waxy leaf and it's tough to get those herbicides to translocate down to the bulb. Uh, Roundup would be the other option. Be careful because you're going to have a bunch of dead spots in your lawn. Uh, but same thing with that, some sort of surfactant to get it to penetrate into the plant. Okay, and so the, on that other picture too, they did say it's in brome, so you wouldn't want to use yeah. anything other than the... Yep, you'd yeah. probably want to go with the 240. And I mean, okay. brome will fill back in because of the rhizomes, right. so if you do kill a little bit, it'll be back. Okay, all right, thank you, Matt. All right, so we have a couple shroom pictures for you. Perfect. The first is a viewer on a farm in Tecama. They've seen these all over on a bunch of trees they took out. They think they are pheasant backs. They are correct. Edible. And edible. And uh, yes, they are edible. So um, it's, they are edible, but I, also, I don't hear that they're the greatest tasting things in the world. So it all kind of depends on really how hungry are you. Um, but, but yeah, we've been seeing um, the pheasant backs really have really been going this time of year. Um, seen a lot of pictures of them. And yeah, you, you can eat them if you want to. All right, enough soy sauce or butter, right? Yes. <laughs> and then the second one is little tiny small shrooms coming up all over in mulch okay. in Lincoln. Okay, so those are... Well, our little brown mushrooms and <laughs> LBMs are what I call them. And it's, there are a ton of little brown mushrooms out there. Um, <laughs> kind of hard to, hard to say what it is for sure. I think it might be a Caprinellis, um, one of, or one of, something similar. Those are our ink cap mushrooms. And I have been seeing a lot of ink caps around campus. So I'm kind of wondering <clears throat> if, if it is the same thing. But really, if you, um, I wouldn't recommend eating those little brown mushrooms regardless of, of where you find them. Um, but if you do, would want that one actually identified, I'd probably need to see a real sample and look at, look at the spores. All right, thank you, Kyle, but do not consume. Right? Do not consume the little brown mushrooms. All right. Sarah, this is a, uh, a North Platte viewer, planted a Deborah maple in 2008 did not untangle the roots, and apparently now when he plants, he knows to untangle the roots, but um, he's seeing some girdling now, and he's wondering whether he should try to cut out that giant circling root. He did cut another one on the other side of the tree earlier. Yeah, this tree definitely has some problems because it has girdling roots almost all the way around the base of the trunk. Yeah. Um, the problem is, there's, it's twofold, really. That, so the roots have already started to compress the trunk. And in the first picture, you could see how the, the trunk was putting out new growth. It was kind of trying to come over the top of the root. So you know that the root is pressing into the trunk and it's already created a compression point there, which is a weak point for the trunk. And quite often we see trees fail at that compressed point where the tree will, in a storm or some event, will just fall over and it'll just break at that point. So removing the root isn't going to fix that. It's not going to grow back. The, the compression is not going to go away. Uh, that's already there. So the other part of the, the two-part answer is that there are a lot of water-absorbing roots attached to that root. So if you cut that root out, you know, you're going to be eliminating some of the, the root system of the tree. 
you're not really going to be fixing the compression. Uh, you know, you would be eliminating future compression of the trunk, but again, the trunk's not really going to repair itself. So I think the viewer is thinking if they cut this root out, that they're going to fix it and the tree is going to go on and be a good tree in the future. And um, I don't not think that's the help. case. It's, it's not going to be fixed. So um, the tree is going to live with this and it's probably going to die with this, unfortunately. <laughs> All right. Unfortunately is right. Mm -hmm. But thanks, Sarah. Well, you know, we've had some very warmer weather come our way, and that means planting time is almost here out at our garden. Our plants are hardening off. They'll soon be in the ground. So here's Terry James to tell us what is going on in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden, we have finally started to move from spring to summer here in Lincoln. We have 80 to 90 degree weather, so our spring has pretty much ended. We have all of our plants moved outside of the greenhouse. They are starting to harden off. Uh, we are having to water them a couple times a day just because of this excessive heat and them not being used to it and them being in those small packs. Not a lot of soil to hold that moisture in. So this week we're gonna get it all planted Remember, our backyard farmer garden has both flowers and vegetables mixed. So we're really excited about showing you some new combinations of vegetables and flowers that you could put in your backyard. We also will be putting mulch down. We saved leaves from last fall. We will clip them up and make them small and use those as our mulch. Nice organic, help keep the soil moisture in, help keep the weeds down and help that rain splash if you, in case any diseases splashed up onto our leaves. Also, we will have our donation garden going. We'll have some tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, all those great foods that we'll be growing for our donation garden to go to the local food bank and pantries here in the East Campus area. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden this week and see what's happening. So we'll be p seeing plants in the garden next time we see you on air and everything does look great. We cannot get, wait to get started and get those plants where they belong for the summer. All right, a round of just questions. Jody, this first okay. one is bees making a nest in the pergola wood. She says it's black and fuzzy. Um, she knows it's a pollinator. She wonders what else it's going to cause damage to. This is in Lincoln. Well, I have had many calls mm -hmm. about these um, just this week. So those are carpenter bees, and you're right, they're pollinators, and they pretty much will only damage your wood, which is still big enough because they're in decks, and mm -hmm. usually they don't like untreated wood, so stains or paint may help, but a lot of times they'll just chew through that. Um, the best way to take care of it is actually with a fly swatter or take a net to them to catch them out so that they won't, I mean, it's an annual thing because they do provision their nests, and then the following year, well, things will emerge from that same tunnel. Um, so that's what you can do. If you are looking for an insecticide treatment, um, there is a dust that you can like shoot in there. Just be very careful, read the label, and then you wanna seal those holes with like a wood putty or steel wool first and, and try to keep them out. I wish that they're, they went in different wood, but they like our structures, so. All right, thanks, Jody. This is a Ralston viewer, Matt, who wants to know how do we control prostrate knotweed this time of year, especially since it's about that tall. Oh, yeah. it's, it grows pretty quick. Um, the earlier you can get at it, the better. And there's a lot, I mean, most of the three, three-way products work. Um, ones that would work quicker would be ones that contain, let's say, carfentrazone or sulfentrazone. And there's quite a few that have that in there. And those actually are a little bit faster than your typical 2,4-D or uh, dicamba. Uh, but those also work in the combination of the products. But yeah, get it now because once it starts you know, spreading out even more, it gets pretty, uh, I'd say, hardened off almost. It's tougher mm -hmm. to kill then because it's really uh, almost stemmy and woody-like. And it also blooms and throws those seeds yes. all over the place. So then you'll just have more for next year. All right, thanks, Matt. Okay, so this is a Hickman viewer. Okay. Kyle, they have um, Baccarat spruce, which is one of the blues, mm -hmm. and brown needles, just a few of them, kind of up in the, in the canopy of these little trees. He wants to take off the lower four feet of branches to be able to manage a disease. 
Well, um, a lot of the a lot of the spruce needle diseases do kind of start from the ground up, and so if you are seeing that the bottom, um, some of the lower branches are starting to get diseased, pruning pruning might be a um, might be a good option for it. And really, pruning um, would increase airflow through the rest of the canopy as well. And so, if you're if you're fine with the look of it being pruned about four feet off the ground, I'd say I'd say go for it. Other thing though is we did have a, a winter this year for the first time in, in a while and spruces are not native to Nebraska. And so they don't necessarily like our winters and so that may be some of the uh, brown needles that you're seeing as well. All right, thanks Kyle. Sarah, this is a viewer who has, uh, this is a Wisner viewer, uh, knockout roses that basically have one little green stem on the bottom of a lot of dead. They're mm. wondering, should they go ahead and give up? Well, you know, with that small amount of, of growth or living tissue left on the plant, um, I would probably start over. You know, I guess if, you, if you're really attached to these plants and you just cannot bear to dig them out and, and replace them, you can certainly give it a try. I would take out all the dead and uh, make, you know, really, really good care. Make sure that they're well mulched, make sure there's no rock, don't over fertilize, make sure you water them well this summer. Maybe. They could recover some vigor and come back, uh, but it sounds like they've got a long road to go. Right. Ready, Sarah? You bet. <laughs> All right, we have a cottonwood in Grand Island that is actually a <laughs> cultivar that is suckering all over the place. They wanna know, can they spray sucker stopper on the suckers? Sure you can. All right. You'll probably get minimal control. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We have a Plattsmouth viewer who has uh, wants to know what to put on their hydrangeas to keep them healthy. They've been putting a lot of potash on. Uh, they don't need potash. We have plenty of potassium in the soil naturally. So unless there's some kind of nutrient deficiency, I wouldn't be adding potash. All right. Uh, we have a viewer who has a 500 square foot garden. Will be gone all summer. What, what would we recommend that he do? If there is no one there to take care of the place, you know, planting a crop cover would be a good idea because you could, um, you know, some kind of legume or something that you could till into the, the soil in the fall when you return, add some organic matter. That'd be a great way to, to handle it. All right. Uh, this is a viewer in Bellevue who has a big dwarf Korean lilac on standard, wants to cut it back by half and is wondering, will they get flowers next year? Well, you're, you're at about the right time of year for pruning because we normally prune lilacs right after they're done blooming. You need to be really careful about how much you take, you take off because you could, you, know, you could really damage the plant or really cause a reduction in vigor. Taking off half of the growth is, much, is a little bit much. We usually say try to stay within about you know, 15 to 20% of the growth uh, at, at one pruning. All right, thanks, Sarah. Okay, you ready, Kyle? Always. <laughs> we, we have a couple of viewers who did find morels on high ground, Okay, but they're all dried up. Is it too late for morels? Uh, yeah, if they're already dry, they're probably not going to taste that great, so leave them. Okay. This is a broken bow viewer who had rust in their green beans last year, and they planted the beans in the same spot this year. Rust again? Um, I would doubt that they actually had rust in their green beans. Um, but if they didn't do all, all of the false annotation, it's in the same spot, there's a good chance that, that if it is a fungal pathogen that it will come back. Okay, we have a Shadron viewer who uh, is wondering, are the pine diseases like Dothostroma prevalent in that part of the state? Yes, they are. All right, we have a dogwood, pagoda dogwood, mm -hmm. that is suddenly wilting. This is in the southeast part of the state. Okay. No insects are visible. Um, could be a few things. It could be a, some, um, some, sort of, some sort of root issue. Could be anthracnose. Really, without having more information, can't, can't tell you. I'm sorry. Okay, we have a Norfolk viewer who wants to use spruce needles as mulch, but the spruce had disease. You um, I would avoid using those disease needles as, as mulch. All right, nice job. Are you ready, Matt? No. Yeah, I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, this one is rearing its little white head again. This is both the Lus Hills and an Eastern Nebraska viewer. Chickweed control, what and if there uh, If there's just a few, pull them, otherwise any 2,4-D base herbicide works pretty well. All right, uh, this is a viewer who wants to know whether buffalo grass should be aerated. If there's compaction, yes. If not, it's probably okay. 
All right, and the same viewer wants to know how often should it be aerated and when? Um, typically, after it's resumed growth, you don't want to do it when it's greening up or going dormant. And I would say just one time a year would be plenty, unless right. it's really compacted. Okay, nut sedge is finally beginning to emerge. What should be done? Treat it. It's time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, annual rye in a seed mix. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, it's good quick cover, but in the end it's going to die. So um, it's just going to go really fast, which is good for erodible ground. All right, this is a Hasting viewer that wants to know if they stop mowing their fescue, will it seed and fill in all the empty spots? Uh, it'll seed, but sometimes a lot of that seed is not viable, but I would guess that, yes, it'll, it'll, it'll fill in eventually. Okay, nice job. <clears throat> Are you ready? Sure, so. I roll, <laughs> I roll. <laughs> okay, um, this viewer is seeing large black bees, in quotes, that have no yellow on them. Any idea what kind of bees those might be? If they're large, if they could be a type of bumblebee. If they, do, if they have a shiny, hairless butt, it could be a carpenter bee, maybe oh. different species. All right. We have aphids on an ornamental sedge, green ones. Is that like some... There's a lot of different aphids for a lot of different plants. If you don't want them there, just shoot them with the hose. Okay. Bumblebees do what besides bumble? Oh, they pollinate. And they, yeah, they don't make honey, but they make honey pots for their own little baby bees. All right, we have a North Platte viewer whose neighbor uses straight bleach on the turf and then 15 minutes later sprays with water no. to get rid of grubs. No, that's, not, is that a question? <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> Thank a Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, big black ants are in a mailbox made of new wood. Any okay. ideas? Uh, it sounds like a carpenter ant. Most people think they're, they're big. Uh, they usually shouldn't feed on the new wood. They're, if there's a dead insect in there, they might be eating protein or for just foraging. Okay, nice job. Who won? Finally. Finally, won. Matt won, Indeed. so <laughs> Matt gets the trophy. <laughs> Taking it home. <laughs> <laughs> you did it for Bill. Yeah, it was. For All right. <laughs> he already won once, so you did it for you. All right, Sarah, what do we have for plants of the week? We have some really pretty columbine. Uh, you know, and columbine is a woodland flower. It, they tend to grow really early in the spring. You know, you think in a woodland setting before the trees have put their leaves on, that's when these understory, you know, forbs like columbine will typically grow and bloom, and then they'll be done pretty shortly, too. So we have a couple of pretty cultivars here. We've got, you know, this is just kind of a wild columbine here. Um, and then this one, this interesting one here, the purple with the, the kind of white center, is called Granny's Bonnet. And it's a, a double columbine, a double layer of petals. But they will both reseed themselves. So um, that can be a good or a bad thing. If you want more columbine, that's great. Um, you know, don't, don't um, put a pre-emergent down in the fall and then you'll have new plants coming and emerging the next year. If you want to keep them in place, they're pretty easily controlled, you know, through hand pulling or hoeing or with a pre-emergent. Um, so they like, you know, columbine are woodland plants, so they prefer kind of partial sun. They like a good well-drained soil with a nice even consistent um, layer of moisture. And usually once they're done blooming, they'll kind of fade out and they'll be gone by midsummer, and then you'll see them again next year. All right, thanks, Sarah, and that is a nice, nice little plant. Definitely. Mm -hmm. All right, so Jody, you have a couple of IDs. Um, the first one here is an unknown moth in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a it's, yeah? I'm really excited that these are actually pictures of insects. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> so this is a polyphemus moth. Yeah. Uh, I watched the show last week, and there were two cocoons on a right. on a tree, and so. This likely came from one of those that look like that. Um, this, the sad thing is, is that they last very like little time as an adult like this. Um, they emerge and they mate and they lay eggs like all within the same day or night. They don't eat as adults, and so if you if you see it, just be really grateful that you got to see it. It's really cool. Uh, brown moth with those eye spots. Cool. And then the second one is uh, also a Lincoln viewer saw this interesting, beautiful thing, which is, I think, a dragonfly of some sort. Um, oh, yeah, so that is the common green darner. Um, it's a very large dragonfly, very, very cool. So um, they migrate, so that's something that people probably don't know, and um, they're naiads or they're nymphs or aquatic, but uh, you can 
tell because it's got um, that it's a green darner because you can see a spot right before the eyes. It's kind of like a bullseye, but they're very, very cool. <laughs> they're predacious as nymphs and adults, so no harm, just their beauty. Yeah, you're pretty happy about I'm some pretty good... happy because it's not a hole in a tree or a scale. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt, this is not so happy. This is a central oh. valley. <laughs> dead spot in oh. yards and wonders and lots of dead spots. Yeah, Any it is thoughts on this? Spots. It looks to me, I mean, it's tough to tell exactly by just a picture, but it almost looks like it's a ryegrass lawn. Mm. And that's the same thing. This winter was really harsh. And if you did have... Um, snow cover or just the cold temperatures sometimes uh, will actually kill them off because uh, the rye is not as tough and it might be in a shaded area as well but I can't see if there's any trees there so the root system would have already been compromised so you're definitely going to need to reseed this area uh, and try and pick a cultivar other than ryegrass so tall fescue or bluegrass um, and they will be a little bit hardier in the winter and for water standing on them if there is or snow all right thank you Matt this is a Bennington viewer, uh, John, or John. It's John in Bennington, actually, All right. Kyle. So uh, this is also a spruce question. He thinks it's a Black Hills, dying from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. um, Dothostroma, which doesn't affect spruce. Yeah, right? that's uh, yeah. Dothostroma is more of a, one of a, one of our pine diseases. Um, I think this is probably either um, Rhizosphera needle blight, which is one that most people are fairly uh, familiar with. <coughs> but we also have another disease that's been showing up more and more often, and that's Stigmina needle blight. And the symptomology on the tree is they're pretty much identical. They'll start from the bottom up. Um, about two-thirds of the tree, the bottom two-thirds of the tree will eventually die, and then the needles will um, just have these black little um, spots that come up, really just right along the, um, um, right along all of the... Uh, stoma. Stoma, yes, the stomates. <laughs> I was going to say that the breathing holes for the needles. Which right? is the same thing. Yes, the... <laughs> but thank you, Sarah. <laughs> yes, thank you. you but yeah, so the, the, the stomata, they'll be um, just some lines of white dots, and when they do have a severe inf um, infestation of either stigmina or rhizosphera, those white dots become black, and those are actually the fungal fruiting bodies coming out. Unfortunately, control for these two diseases is fairly different, so I would recommend if you were wanting to save that tree, which I don't really know if it would be worth it, um, those bottom branches probably won't come back, but if you do have a, an alien spruce, it is important um, to, to know if you have either rhizosphera or stigmina, just because the uh, control will be different. All right, thank you, Kyle. Uh, let's see, Sarah, this is a McPherson County viewer, and they have a, a an evergreen, a pine that is a mugo here, we think, and they like it as a shrub. They're wondering if they can reduce its vigor, or should they take it out? Yeah, you know, this is a problem with mugo. We plant them when they're small, and they look really appropriate where they're put, but then, you know, they get big. They get bigger than people <laughs> expect them to get. And unfortunately, there isn't a good way to reduce the size on pines, you know, since we have, if you cut back into a section of a branch where there's no green needles, then that branch is dead. It won't generate any new growth. You can cut, when, when they're candling at this time of year, you can cut the candles back by about halfway mm -hmm. and, and limit how much they grow. But this plant is already pretty overgrown for this site. And so there's no way for you to bring that size back down and have a nice looking plant. So. If, if it's way too big and you just don't like it at this point, I think you're going to have to bite the bullet and just take it out and then just, you know, redo the landscaping at the front of the house. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Well, oak trees are part of a solid foundation of overstory trees that provide us beauty and shade, not to mention a bunch of food for a lot of creatures. We took our cameras out to Great Plains Nursery in Weston to talk to Heather Byers about what kinds of oaks we should plant. Oak trees are an excellent selection for a shade tree here in Nebraska. And fortunately, we have a lot of great options to choose from. Here in Nebraska, we have seven native oak trees. We have bur oak, chinkapin, dwarf chinkapin, white oak, red oak, black oak, and blackjack. But we don't have to just stop there. We have lots of options to choose from. 
This right here is our um, is a chinkapin oak, which is our native. You can see the catkins hanging. It's an excellent choice. It's one of my favorite trees. Um, oaks provide a lot of wonderful benefits. Um, number one would be the ecological value that they provide, which is um, a bur oak alone can support over 500 species of caterpillars and in turn supports our birds and just the whole circle of life. This here is a hills oak, which is another underutilized selection for Nebraska. What I want to point out with this one is the new growth is a red leaf, which is often um, an under underappreciated season with oaks is the spring. Um, you do get the catkins that hang that look a lot kind of like little earrings, but that new growth of the red new growth is really quite stunning when it is in full force. And then we get an excellent fall color from this hills oak. These seedlings here represent uh, some of the oaks that are in the red oak group. Um, all of them are excellent selections here in Nebraska. What's unique about the red oak group is oftentimes they'll hold their leaves into the winter and we'll push them off the next spring. So it provides some nice winter interest and provides a windbreak quality as well. Uh, one of my favorites is the black oak. It's a little bit slower growing of an oak, but it has beautiful red fall color, a bright red. Um, it's just a very unique leaf to it. It almost doesn't even look like a red oak in the red oak group. Um, it's a little bit wider leaf and has some fuzz to it. Um, the red oak, the schumard, and the scarlet oak are all very similar and oftentimes interchanged and hard to tell apart. Um, it almost is like you have to have the acorns next to each other to be able to tell the difference. But all excellent choices, uh, faster growing oaks. And then we have the shingle oak, which oftentimes people don't believe is a, an oak at all. Um, it has a, a wide, long leaf, um, fast growing oak. Holds, it, holds its leaves uh, into the winter as well. Um, one thing that we've really started noticing about the shingle oak is that it's not showing any um, trouble with herbicide damage, whereas some of the other oaks will kind of be sensitive to that. The shingle oak isn't showing that at all, which is kind of a, a neat new feature about it. Um, and then we have the sawtooth oak, which is not a native to the, to the US, but is interesting in its own. This is our dwarf chinkapin oak, which is very unique to Nebraska. We're lucky because we have one of the only native stands um, of dwarf chinkapin oak down in the southeast corner of Nebraska. It's a really neat shrubby oak, um, which means that it'll be multi-stemmed. It's a smaller stature oak, um, very similar to our straight chinkapin, but it's just smaller stature, smaller leaves, um, and then it'll have that multi-stem look to it. It bears acorns at a very young age, which make it a great habitat plant and make it just kind of fun for having in your small garden. Um, kids love it because of the nice, cute little small acorns. So the next time that you're choosing a new tree for your property, I encourage you to try an oak. They're an excellent choice here for Nebraska and they are the backbone of our community forest. And with the problems we have with our ash trees, really a good time to consider planting oaks. I have a number in my yard and I really like them. Yeah. All right, Jody. so yes, you can say we've already said, seen this, but we have maples that are not leafing out. Is this a scale insect? Can it be treated and will the tree recover? And there's the tree. And I think we have a picture of the scales on yes. the tree. So another scale, it's very, much the same as what I said earlier about trying, if you can't remove them, wait for the crawler stage, which is like, I don't know, now and for the next week, um, and treat with horticultural oil. Yeah, that's scale. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, weeds in new grass. This is your picture, uh, Matt. This is a viewer in Holdridge. He says he planted a combination of fescue and bluegrass this spring, looks good, has lots of weeds and violets. He knows to treat violets in the fall. What can he do to remove the weeds and the <clears throat> violets now? Yeah, it, it actually looks really good. Mm -hmm. It's green. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of weeds in there, but there's also a lot of grass, so that's good. Um, mm -hmm. What you can do is, if, if you've mowed it a couple times already, um, you can actually start using some of the normal products you would use to control these. Uh, some of the three-way products will actually knock those violets back so that they don't outcompete the turf. They might not kill them, so you probably have to retreat this fall. Uh, another product would be the Scott's product with the mesotrione in it, and that actually will help with that too. It'll actually turn them white. So if you don't want the whiteness, uh, probably stick with some other herbicides, but looks good. All right. I, I like violets in my yard. Yeah, there's a lot of flowers <laughs> and turf and all right. that good stuff. And it's green. Okay, so a virus question for you, Kyle. This okay. is a uh, outside Lincoln viewer. 
She has kefir pears and she says the leaves are totally covered. You can see, I think a little, this is really the only picture she sent. She's wondering, is it too late to treat? And she also said her cherry tree was covered, but then it dropped most of its leaves. Well, if the cherry tree's already dropped its leaves, I wouldn't worry about that one. Um, as far as these spots, there are quite a few different leaf spots that, that pear trees can get. Um, pear rust is one of them, and so if you start to see some kind of horns coming out from the bottom of, of those leaves later in the season, that would be rust. Otherwise, uh, mycosfer mycosferella leaf spot is another one that, that can attack both pears and cherries. As far as um, treatment, if you really want to, yeah, um, now would be a fine time to do some sort of copper, um, copper fungicide would work. Otherwise, chlorothaninil as well. All right, and so again, this is an example of it wasn't a virus. It, was, it wasn't a virus. It was this yeah. probably fungal, but it might even be bacterial. So I would just actually, please send me a sample. Perfect. <laughs> That's to, what you exist for. The, I have to plug the clinic. There you go. <laughs> All right, Sarah, uh, this is a viewer, actually Lake of the Ozarks. Okay. Uh, high winds split the tree and then it's been strapped together and he's wondering is there any way to save it. We, we don't have any other pictures of this, but. So, you know, here again, I think people think if they hold it together long enough that this will eventually join, rejoin, and mend, and heal, you know, it's heal itself back together, and it's not gonna do that. Yeah. What's gonna happen is the branches, as you, as you let it grow, there's gonna be more and more weight on those branches, and there'll be more and more stress on this, this failure right here, and eventually the tree is gonna fail at this point. So people usually say, well, can I cable it? Can I bolt it? Can I have an arborist come and bolt it through the middle? Won't that solve it? No, it's it, it just, it's just, lengthening you know the, the the time before it fails because with all that growth that's going to come on the tree over the next few years there's just so much more stress that's going to be on that joint so um former tree yeah i would i would take it out and start over <laughs> One seems more. to be my theme tonight boy i'm really <laughs> sorry folks i really am it kind of always is <laughs> yeah. with trees yeah. right now it's like yeah cut that one down yeah <laughs> All right, well, we have announcements of fun things in the gardening world, of course, as always, and I believe our first one tonight is the Monument Valley Iris Society Annual Iris Show and Sale, June uh, 1st and 2nd at University of Nebraska Extension Center. This is in Scotts Bluff, so panhandle. And then we, Backyard Farmer, will be on location at Bayside Golf Club, which is out there by Brule, Monday, June 3rd at 5 p.m. Mountain, open to the public. So we want that cheering audience for us. We love to go on location. And our third one, of course, is Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. You can watch us on Facebook, Sunday, May 19th, 6.30 p.m. Central Time. We really like that audience interaction on that one. So fun things in the gardening world. We have a tiny little uh, number of like a minute, Jody. This uh, is a okay. termite treatment question. They found termites, had the home treated, was told couldn't grow food plants within eight to 12 feet, move the herb garden, has rhubarb. So what do you think? What are we gonna say about the termite treatments? Well, did the termite treatment Work hopefully, or this is a question yeah. of whether they, or not they can eat, eat the, the rhubarb right. because of the, tr the right. termite treatment. Um, yeah. I probably wouldn't, but if you have more questions, I would co contact the manufacturer of of the product that was used. They have those, I guess, warnings there for a reason. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was best not not to plant there. That's yeah. on the label. Yeah, or at least not to eat what is already in that right. zone because of the way that right. particular. Termite aside or whatever it's called. Yeah, I mean, it stays worse. pretty much in the soil, but there's a, a reason why they, they say that, so. All right, perfect.